right, welcome to week two, day one, IS50B people. Um, today we're going to be talking about acceleration structures. Acceleration structures are what make game engines go fast. So, um, when you got one triangle and you want to re render it on the screen, it's not a big deal, right? Like, your, your 3090 Ti graphics card can 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 draw one triangle pretty quickly, right? Like it's not a it's not a um, it's not a big deal. IS fifty B spring twenty twenty two. But if you've got like a billion triangles on the screen and they're all overlapping each other and things like this, maybe there's one in front that's just like blocking all of those guys out. Then even your mightiest thirty ninety Ti is going to slow to a crawl. Uh, let's call this acceleration structures. Have you guys both had 41? Seaside 41? I'm in Seaside 41. You're in 41, okay. What about uh, Karente? Yeah, I've done the whole series, but I'm in 45 always. Yeah, okay. Just double checking. So, <clears throat> here's the thing. If, I'll, if let's say you got a billion triangles back here and then there's just one triangle in front in front of the camera that's blocking all of them there's absolutely no reason for the video game to render anything other than that front triangle right uh, but if you just did it the brute force way where you just draw a triangle to the screen you draw a triangle to the screen uh, even even the mightiest 3090 ti is going to suffer so we use data structures uh, customized for 3d rendering to speed them up. And what you really want is a structure where you can ask a couple different questions. Uh, first of all, uh, point contents. In other words, what is at that point? Right? So at, look at x is equal to 10, y is equal to negative 220, z is equal to 30, what's there? And your data structure should be able to return lava, right? Or, you know, a sentry gun. You guys follow me on this? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Thanks so. Yeah. Does that, does that make sense? Like, if you got, you got some data structure holding your world, we haven't gotten to any details on it yet. And, it, and, and the most basic thing is, like, what's at that point? You know? And uh, Stover, the one data structure you know probably pretty well right now, is a vector, right? And uh, yeah. And you know unordered maps too, hash tables. Yeah, those are pretty nice. Okay. Fast. Vectors, yeah. Arrays. Okay. So. Uh, so let's let's maybe talk about that. But in one second, the other question is like a trace line, right? And the trace line is. Uh, from point A to point B, what is the first thing I hit? Right, hit scan weapons. Starting point is the end of your gun. Ending point is the end of your gun plus forward vector times a thousand or whatever. Starting point, ending point. Here's a here's a ray through the world. Tell me what I hit. What's the first thing I hit? That makes sense, to you guys. Very useful. Very useful uh, thing to know, right? Whew. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's also probably radius search. This is probably pretty pretty useful to you. Uh, radius search, which is to find everything. Uh, everything within X meters of point A. Right, so grenade goes off, tell me what got hit. Yeah. So these, this is kind of the three basic things that an acceleration structure should be, they, they should be able to answer, right? And, uh, the uh, the the bad the bad option is unfortunately a vector right 
So if you have, uh, let's just toss out the word a billion. Let's say you've got a, mil a billion objects in a vector, not sorted in any way. It's just, you've got a car and you got a apple and you got a monitor and a bookshelf and they have an X and Y and Z location and they have a size. And I ask you, what is that location 10, 20, negative 300? How would you go about answering that if all you had was just an unsorted vector? What what would your algorithm look like and why would it be terrible? Well, unsorted? If there's nothing fancy going on, like chunks or, you know, localized objects, you just have to look through every single thing in the vector, which is pretty slow. Yep, that's exactly right. You go through every single object in the vector and be like, am I inside of you? Am I inside of you? Am I inside of you? And it's super duper slow. All right. And uh, same issue for rendering. You know, if you're going to render... A scene and all you got is a vector you just go through every object draw the desk draw the chair draw the you know raspberry pi draw the wall you know and just keep painting painting them to the screen maybe some of them are behind the camera so those get cold or whatever but not great super not great um and so you said you know you knew unordered maps so this is like maybe an okay option okay so this is actually a reasonable um called a hash table, which is another name. In C++, it's called an unordered map, but it's hash table. So we can do something called a hash table, okay? And so what we could do is do a 2D array, okay? And this is how games like Oblivion and Skyrim and things kind of work at the, the big map level. So you've got different cells of world. You know, this is like zoomed out really far over Cyrodiil or you know, whatever. So like, you know, maybe you have some mountains here and you got like a house here and you got like some trees, you know, over here. It's nice. That one came out green. That's an autumn tree. There you go. This one's a, another green tree. There you go. And so you can have a hash table, a 2D hash table. And inside of each one of these buckets might just be a vector, right? And so if you, if you have a grenade go off here, um, the whole grenade is localized within that, that bucket, right? Do you guys understand this is like the X direction in the world and this is like the Y direction? So is that kind of like chunking? Like we have a bunch of different squares that we pick which one we're in or we need to compute something in? Mm -hmm. Yep, and so like when you're, when you're walking around in Oblivion, if you have your graphics detail settings turned all the way down, it only draws uh, the neighboring chunks. Do you remember doing that in the map, uh, the map thing last year? The the map streaming. It's over. Right. Maybe map streaming for my SFTA. Maybe we didn't or... do it. It's all it's all the distant past at this point. But uh, this is how like Oblivion works. So like if you turn your graphics detail settings all the way down, it'll draw everything in the current cell you're in. Like maybe you're here. Like I'm, you know. You know, these are big chunks of, of land, right? And then it'll draw all the people and mountains and rivers and stuff in your chunk and the neighboring chunks. That makes sense? Yeah. yeah. And if you turn up your detail settings, then it'll render further and further ones away, right? So you get more of the map kind of rendering. Okay. So... Uh, but uh, you, this this works okay as an acceleration structure, actually. If you if you have a grenade go off here, and you just have a vector, right? You've got a vector of like you know it's got like a mountain, a mountain, and a house. The grenade goes off. You just do a little check to see: Am I near the mountain? Nope. Am I near the mountain? Nope. Am I near the house? Yep. Okay, damage the house. That makes sense. So rather than having to deal with a billion. Um, Rather than having to deal with a billion objects in the world, there's three. Grenade, does that make sense to you? Yeah, and does that mean like, say we throw a grenade or throw a projectile that's supposed to damage some part of the world? Mm -hmm. Is it spawning in, not as a character, but as like an object that has to 
Because, I mean, I don't know how to explain my question. Because, like, we're obviously in, like, the character is in their own chunk. But if we throw the grenade five chunks over... Mm -hmm. The person could be here, right? Grenade at guys. Sure. And and yeah. so when when you throw it, the, the over time, the grenade's going to travel in an arc, right? Mm -hmm. And so every frame, and, and it can leave one chunk and join another one, right? Okay. And, and so as objects move, they will traverse from one chunk to another. And then when they explode, um, if you're on a corner, then it gets annoying, right, to write this code. You know what I mean? Because yeah. now you've got to check things in, in four areas. And if it's a big explosion, well, <laughs> now you're going to do the entire map and it doesn't help you, right? But yeah. at that point, like, yeah, it hits everything. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, you probably accelerated the other way. It just hits everything, you know. I don't know. Yeah. You know, maybe maybe you just only check the corners, you know, like if it, if it was like this, you know. Only check the corners to see if you don't hit it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, that's why explosions in games tend to be small, also. It's, it'll it'll right. lag a game if you um, do something that affects everything in the world. Um, yeah, okay. So, yeah. That, but good question. Yeah, you can you can throw it, and then it could be uh, hitting things over here. And if, if it had... Uh, so, it, maybe if what you're getting at, like, what if you throw it, like, way over here, right? And this, yeah. this world wasn't loaded. You can't do that, <laughs> right? Well, you know, the, these these chunks are also like square kilometers, right? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so if you're so if you're like in Oblivion and it's only loading the nearby kilometer, you're talking about throwing a grenade like two kilometers away. Yeah. And and the reality is it just won't. There's nothing there, and so the grenade will just fall through the the, the void, you yeah. know, because it's not loaded. And you typically put fog out at about a kilometer and so you just can't see the fact the land is loading in front of you you know yeah and, and that and that's a and that's a real thing like in Valheim uh when you go through a portal it actually keeps running the area you came from for five minutes and then if you don't go back through that portal it turns it off it unloads it oh that makes a lot of sense yeah so it'll it'll keep and, and all the monsters will run around and do their things and so you can immediately come right back through if you if you need to, and, and you can transit back and forth, and it's fast, yeah. fast, fast. But if you leave after a while, it's like, okay, he's not coming back for a while, and then they unload it, and the next time you go through, it, there's that loading screen again to l reload all the all the train and stuff. Oh, thanks. And, and, and that has an issue, though. Like, if you're taming an animal, the animal's gone. <laughs> yeah. It'll tame for five minutes, and then you leave through a portal, and then it despawns everything, and when you come back, it, it'll reload, hopefully. But all, it, it's not being tamed in the meantime, right? It's only being yeah. tamed while you're in that chunk of the world. So you have to kind of hang out and farm and stuff while the animal's, yeah. like, eating the, the whatever. So, yeah, no, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, this, this, this notion of, like, a top-down 2D hash table, it's fine. It's used in a lot of big outdoor games, you know? And, uh, and it, you know, if you want to do point contents, what's, what's here? Well, you just go through the vector. There's three trees in that chunk. See if that points inside of those three trees. You know, it's not the fastest thing in the world, but it's fast enough, you know, and it's easy to write. Uh, the only, the only issue being like when there's, like I said, when there's like a mountain or something over multiple chunks, then, you know, you start getting into performance issues and it can be, it can be kind of a pain to, to deal with. Like, if you have an explosion here, right, it's going to hit the mountain twice, right? Because it'll hit it once in this chunk, and it'll hit it once in this chunk. You see that? Because each chunk has its own list of things. And so you have to make sure you don't have any duplicates. It, it can get kind of annoying, especially when you have things straddling, you know, the, the boundary lines. Um, Asherin's Call uh, laid out everything in, in vertical strips. And so they actually did this for their server balancing. And so they had like, I don't know, let me draw America here. Yeah, that's America. <laughs> Fantasy America. So I can't get uh, accused of being unpatriotic. Um, that's Texas. Uh, here's Fresno. Okay. So, and then we've annexed Newfoundland. and <laughs> So the way that Asherin's Call, uh, have you guys heard of this, Asherin's Call? I have not. It, it, it was one of the first uh, three 
MMOs that made it big. So the, the original three MMOs, there was Meridian 59 before all of these, but the first three MMOs that really made it big were Ultima Online, EverQuest, and Asheron's Call. And so a friend of mine worked on Asheron's Call and he told me this story. So the way that they, they kind of had the world set up was in vertical strips. And so this would be server one, this would be server two, server three, server four. And so it's the same kind of idea, except um, as you crossed over a certain line, then it would actually transfer you from one server to another. So they actually had um, like people would exit a server and go onto, the, it would be transparent to you. It would appear to all just be the same contiguous geographical areas but basically you would be passed from one server to the next. And they had a problem, which was that they had a giant city here and they had a giant city down here. <laughs> and so you would have like nobody here and nobody here. And then they would have a bunch of giant, you know, a bunch of people on like this one vertical strip. And so, um, and so they solved the problem by, in the storyline, Asheron's Call was unique in the fact it had an ongoing storyline. Every couple months, a new chapter would come out. The world would change. Boss events would happen. Um, sometimes piloted by GMs, like they would actually walk around and actually interact with people in the cities and things like that. It was a really cool idea and it, and it worked all right. Um, but what they did was, you know, chapter 30, giant meteor hits the city. <laughs> so... So they literally wiped out one of the cities uh, in the world because of this uh, chunking issue here. Because they, 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 there were too many people on, on this one particular server just because it happened to be just north of another one. And so they literally blew up a city and everyone was like, oh my gosh, I've never seen that done before in a video game. Like I had my house here and it's just a crater now. And there were some people that like logged off inside of like a tavern and then when they walked outside of the door, uh, they fell to their death because it was now a giant pit. You know, because the, the indoor area is a separate zone, right? And then when you click on the door and you and it puts you back into the world, it's like at this X, Y, and Z location, and you go, uh oh, there's no ground here now. And then the people would fall to their death their their death. It's actually pretty funny. And people were like blown away and they're like, oh, it was such a good event. I can't believe, like it's such a mind blowing thing that they would actually do that. You know, and it was just because of the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the way they were accelerating it. So wipe that off. So yeah, so this is, this is a pretty, uh, I, I think both of you could probably implement this, right? Especially if you don't have rectangles, if you just have points, you know what I mean? Like if, if all you had was like, you know, objects, you know, kind of moving around like this, and like you guys think you could probably implement that, Crente server. No. Maybe. Maybe. I I haven't really messed with vectors or stuff that much in Unity yet, so I'll need to practice. Not in Unity. I just mean like on on oh, on the not server, Unity, just me, pure, purely in text. Yeah. Oh. Like in uh, in the terminal, oh. you know, you can have you can have. Uh, billiard balls bouncing around right like the dvd logo you know trying to get into the corner and uh and they could bounce off each other right and if you were going to simulate like a million of them you only want to check collisions between one billiard ball and another billiard ball in the same zone you understand like you don't want to check collisions with everybody if you want to see if you hit somebody you just want to see if it's within your region right yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so that that would be done using a uh, in this case uh, either a, a point content if it's a point like is there another point at that point? Yes. Okay. Bounce and you do a little bit of physics like I'm going to impart momentum and all that stuff. Or if they're um, if they're actual spheres, then you do a radius search. So find all billiard balls within a centimeter of this point, and if you hit something, then do the the physics collision. And if you do that, um, then you could have thousands or millions of points all moving around inside of a, a box, bouncing around and colliding with each other. And rather than having to check a million times a million point, right? Because it, like, right? Do you guys understand? Like, if you had, if you had like three boxes that are all kind of like moving around, right? 
and you didn't have an acceleration structure, every frame you'd move them and then you'd check does A collide with B? Does A collide with C? Does A collide with D? Does A collide with E? Does A collide with F? No? Okay. Does B collide with A? Does B collide with C? Does B collide with D? Does B collide with F? Right? And it's an it's an N squared, right? Collision is normally an order N squared um, endeavor. So if you had a million uh, things all moving around, it would normally take a million squared operations to see if any of them collide. Do you understand why that's bad in a real-time game? So this is, you're saying like, we in the chunks, we just say like, okay, these are the people in the chunks. Are those people hitting those people? Mm -hmm. Yep. So it reduces, yeah. it reduces this n squared to, it, it's still a squared, but it's going to be a very small, it's going to be like an order little n squared. You know what I mean? Like, so it, it because you're only checking against the people in, in your, your neighborhood, which might be three or four people, right? So this would be 16 checks, roughly. But you're not going to be checking. This guy wouldn't check to see if he's hitting this guy. That makes sense, Krenta? Like, this guy over here yeah, can't sense. hit. He can't hit anybody over here because he's nowhere near him. Right? So. And it's going to be buckets times the average number of particles per bucket squared. Right? So it's... it's if you make too many buckets, if you make billions of buckets, then then the number of buckets will overwhelm the calculation. So there's a kind of a tunable parameter, right? Like how big you want your buckets to be. And um, that's something you kind of play with and benchmark. And, and I, I've done this before and, and you sit there and all right, I'll make the size 10 by 10. Uh, okay. Make it 15 by 15. Ooh, that's faster, you know? So, um, Stover, do you understand why, what I mean by order and squared? Like if you got a million, yeah. Okay. It's just because everything has to check against every other thing. Yeah. And so we want that to be we want that to be faster. So so yeah, the, the hash table approach, A okay. Um and you could do this not even with the unordered map um approach. You could just use a vector of vectors of vectors. <laughs> vector of vectors, make a two D array. And then each element in that vector is itself a vector of objects. So it'd be a vector of vector of vectors. <laughs> uh, yep. So that that is a perfectly good uh, acceleration structure. Now, another one uh, that is most commonly used is called a uh, BVH, and this is the official sponsor of. No, this is the official acceleration structure for RTX graphics cards. Okay, so RTX graphics cards. Have you guys ever seen those memes of like RTX off, RTX on? Like, yeah. yeah. So, do you know what RTX actually does, like in hardware? Like, do you, like, not at all. Like, you know, it does ray tracing, right? Like, yeah, ray tracing. But like, oh, that part, yeah. Yeah, but what? How? Like, how does how does it do it? Right. Um, I, it <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it primarily focuses on lighting. Yes, it, it can. It you you can actually use the the ray tracing for. Uh, you don't have to ray trace your entire scene. You can just use it to do like what's called global illumination, which um, has like bounce lighting and things like that. But what RTX actually does is this. That's it. it it's it's hardware support for a acceleration structure called bounding volume hierarchy. So let's say that you've got a um, guitar. Or maybe it's kind of looking like a violin at this point, I don't know. Okay. It's a violin now, who knows. Okay. Put a little chin rest on there. And you want to see, is this point within the violin or not? So if you were doing this with a bounding volume hierarchy, what you would first do is you would wrap a bounding box around the whole thing. It'd be a little bit tighter on the tight on the top side here, but whatever. Um, so uh, sometimes sometimes you just stop there. 
You know, like if you've ever played a video game and you've shot like this part on a person, like in that kind of corner between their their head and their shoulder, and you hit, that's because in a lot of games people are represented uh, with a cylinder, right? Or they rep they represent a person with a capsule. That's how Unreal Engine does it, right? A person is it's a cylinder with kind of a half sphere on top and bottom, and so it doesn't map to the contours of the human body particularly well, or at least around here, you know. So um, sometimes you just do a bounding box, and so this is something called an A A B B. Have you guys heard this term before? Not me. Yeah. Yep. So this stands for an axis aligned. bounding box. So here's the X direction, here's the Y direction, you see how the box is flat along the X direction and the Y direction. So it is an axis aligned bounding box. And then it's a very simple test, like if the X here is 2 and the X here is 10 and the Y here is uh, 4 and the Y here is like 8. Uh, if you want to see if like point uh, 7 comma 6 is within is, is a hit you know do you guys see how easy that is yeah 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 the sevens between a 2 and a 10 the six is between the 4 and the 8 it's inside right this is super easy to do okay you got like you guys could write that code in five minutes right given a rectangle is a point within it right yeah, it's very pretty. Maybe I'll even give that to you tomorrow on forty one. We'll see. I gotta I gotta make up a new homework for you guys anyway. You make us do that in assembly. Oh, that's a good idea. It actually wouldn't be bad in assembly. Right? Because you 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 learned how to do if statements today, right? So oh, if yeah. If X is between, if it's greater than 2 and less than 10, and the Y is greater than 4 and less than 8, it, it, it'd be kind of annoying, but you'd have like four different comparisons or whatever. And, and if it makes it past all four, then yes, it's inside. Otherwise, you jump to, no, it's outside and call it a day. So um, it, you could actually probably write that in about, 10 lines of assembly, not counting the boilerplate. Not bad, not bad. And it's fast. The, the only trouble is what? What's the trouble with saying that, yes, this is violin? That Check. one's not really a rectangle? It's not actually in the violin, right? Like, it's close yeah, to it. Accuracy. Right? It's not, it's not that bad, you know? And for a lot of games, like, we actually just roll with this. Right, like if you're if you're gonna be like picking up an object in a video game, and you click here, right? You actually want it to pick up the violin, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, most of the time. Most of the time, yeah. Maybe not so with with hit registration, but yeah. like if you're like trying to, yeah. You know, it's actually nice when you like look at it and then think highlights, and then you can click on it and pick it up without having to like exactly, you know, hit the peg or whatever, you know. And actually, like, for a lot of video games, it's good enough. And we just, like, call it a day, you know. And so that is a very simple... Uh, it's not really much of a hierarchy because it's just one thing, but it's a very simple bounding volume hierarchy. This is a bounding volume. A bounding volume is a... This is a bounding box. And, you know, it wraps the, it wraps the object. And there's no hierarchy. If you wanted to make it a hierarchy, here's what you do. Inside of that box, we'll have one rectangle for the the body. And maybe switch, let me switch out colors on this. So you can see it a little easier. Um, white, why not? So we'll have one box for the body and one box for the neck and one box for the head right so one 
and two, and three. Okay? So if you do a BVH, you don't check these three originally. This is the this is the root right here. This box here is the root. And so if you want to see if this point over here is inside of it, you're like, no. So if, if this is not in, inside of the root, do you have to check one, two, and three? Nope. Hmm. Because these guys are entirely inside of the root node. So it can be very fast. Nope. Miss. Easy. Okay. But if it's inside of the box and you hit this point here, then you check that point against one and two and three. That makes sense? Yeah, it's a bit like the, uh, I forget what it's called already, but the, the map split up into chunks. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so this would be a hit, this would be a miss, and you know, you're never going to check more than a couple boxes out of the billion in the world, right? So, um, uh, and so BVH extends that even further, like you might have one sub box, sub sub box here, and you guys, you guys see where I'm, what, what I'm getting at? Like, you know, and then you might have a sub box here and a sub box here, right? You guys see what I mean? And so inside of three, so if you got a hit on three, and you want to know if that point is, in, is actually inside of it, then you go down another level and check inside of it. Like, you guys see what I'm getting at here? It's kind of like a hierarchy of box detail. Exactly. Yeah. And so only if you hit a particular box, then you go inside of it and see if any of the sub boxes were hit. And if you hit that one, if it has sub boxes, you go inside of it. And that's why it is a bounding volume hierarchy. And what RTX does is that in hardware. Yeah. That's it. That's what it does. What do you mean by hardware? That means oh. your graphics card can do this. So if I say, hey, what is at this point? The graphics card can tell me. If I, it, usually it's not point contents. Usually you, you trace a line. So if I have a gun, here's my gun, and here's the start point, and here's the end point, and I'm shooting it. This is like a 3D thing, whatever. I'm shooting it this way. The graphics card, your graphics card, do you know how much more powerful your graphics card is than your CPU? Probably a good bit. It's a lot more yeah. powerful. Yeah, and so your graphics card can tell you, yes, that hit the violin and it hit the violin at that point right there. That's what RTX on means. It means the, okay. the graphics card itself is given a BVH for the scene and then it can do things like say, if you, draw a line from here to here, what does it hit? Okay. That's 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 what it does. That's all RTX on is. It's hardware support, it's silicon support for doing a BVH tree traversal. And when you hit something, then you can do things like generate a new a new line that comes off this way. Oh, that hit something here, then generate a new line, you know, the mirror or something, hit something here, you know. And so it has support for reflections and things like that but that's basically what it does it's a it's a way of accelerating you know figuring out what you hit okay using a bbh yeah because normally when you say hardware normally it's the cpu which do the calculation but rtx is okay graphics card so. mm -hmm. and if you've ever seen like um RTX Ultra, RTX Good. Have you seen that before? Like um, RTX yeah. High versus RTX Mid. Okay, so RTX Low, RTX Medium, RTX High, RTX Ultra. I actually can't see much of a difference between them. Uh, the left one, uh, the left one's kind of pixelated. You see that? I think the main difference. Oh, never mind. I was gonna say the water droplets, but that made the water droplets. Yeah. Well, 
after low, I can barely see like it. And there's like a pretty sharp increase in detail from low to medium. Yeah. But after then, it's just like, I don't even. I, yeah, I can't really see. Like, even the little bits of dirt and stuff like that, like, they look. But I was going to ask, when they, like, because I know it's a big thing in tech of just, like, upgrading something a year mm -hmm. and then releasing it. Mm -hmm. So when they do that for a graphics card, are they focusing mainly on speed, just for everything? Or what, like, what is the point of them moving from a 20 series to a 30 and then a 30 to a 40? Yeah, so... Um, so for example, like the, one of the big things was adding support for RTX. Like that was a huge generational increase. Uh, but they have, um, here, let me pull up the specs on it. So there between a 2080 Ti, uh, versus a 3090. Um, they add, they usually add more, um, wow, <laughs> that's, <laughs> it's a bit optimistic for price, That's but crazy. Um, yeah, they're they're surprisingly close in price. Um, I actually upgraded for about six hundred dollars between these two, not three hundred. Unfortunately, I was hoping to get. I got like eleven hundred for mine, and uh, my thirty ninety was like seventeen hundred, which I feel is actually a pretty good price for a thirty ninety these days. It was below oh, MSRP. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I was on the EVGAQ, and so you know these things are ridiculously expensive. But like, by rec by selling your old card and then getting the new one, it actually keeps the cost kind of to a thing where I can justify it to myself and my wife. You know, so um, yeah. So you can see the difference here. Reflection. So um, thirty nineties have a lot better ray tracing performance. So for example, they might just add more ray tracing cores to it. So when you're when you're rendering a scene with this, you're gonna shoot a ray at every pixel on the screen, right? And that tells you what color, you know, because it's gonna hit a red a red wall. Okay, that's red. It hits a blue wall, okay, that pixel's blue. And when you go from low to mid to high to ultra, what it's doing is it's sending more and more rays at the screen, because they're for a, a very simple rendering, if it hits a red screen, you're like, it's red. But for more complicated scenes, they're going to reflect. It's going to be a shiny plastic surface. And so when that ray hits the shiny violin, it's going to bounce a ray off. And then that could hit something that's also reflective or refractive. And so that can cast more rays and things like that. And so a graphics card that has better, more, just more cores, they can send more rays out per second they get a much better frame rate. In fact, you can see it's almost 50% faster. It's 42% faster, um, the 3090 than the 2080 Ti. It seems like a lot of the features and stuff that's added, especially like ray tracing, is just like computer ways of adding physics and just like literally physics from the real world yeah yeah that's been a big part of it um because back in the day we had to cheat you know like we couldn't we couldn't simulate skin properly and so we had to cheat and uh try to make people's skin not look like plastic <laughs> you know and now it's like all right just turn on subsurface scattering and we'll we'll simulate a light ray bouncing off the surface and we'll simulate a right a light ray going into the skin bouncing around and coming out as red you know and you just click, you just click an option on Unreal, on Unreal Engine, and it does it. You know, yeah, well, you know, you're absolutely right. A lot of it has to do with the, um, um, just we're actually simulating physics a lot more accurately now. Uh, it's wonderfully optimistic. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Yeah, so much faster frame rate. Got a lot more uh, RAM. And that's useful because you have to have the whole scene in RAM, right? If you want to do ray tracing, you have to have that entire BVH in your graphics card memory, right? Because that's how it does the ray tracing. So you have to have a copy of all the world's geometry in your card's memory. And so that's why, you know, the, the 3090 Ti has 24 gigs of RAM and my PC only has 32 gigs. Like it's pretty comparable, you know? Um, 
Uh, let's see here. Okay, here we go. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. How many CUDA cores? Oh no, these are CUDA benchmarks. Um, oh no, that's version of CUDA, sorry. Graphics processor. Uh, it's, a, it's a smaller process. So that means that they could fit more transistors onto a smaller, it's actually a smaller chip. It's a, it's, it's, so that means it's probably cheaper to make, depending, I mean, all, all else being the same, which it's not, because a 12 nanometer process is gonna be more expensive than, that eight is gonna be more expensive than a 12. But, uh, you can pack more things more densely. And so you can see they have 28 uh, billion transistors versus 18 billion. So that means they can use those transistors to build RTX cores, more compute cores, you know, um, you know, the pixel shaders, things like that. And uh, faster memory. And here we go. So yeah, so there, there's your difference right there. So the ray tracing cores, there's 82 on a 3090 and there's 68 on a 2080 Ti. Does that answer your question? Yeah? No? Like, what happens when you go up a generation? Yeah, that makes sense. yeah, so we've gone from 68 to 82, and in fact, when you look at the benchmarks, like, it's pretty much, that's the increase in ray tracing performance, right? Um, what was it, a 42% increase in real-world performance, 68 times 0.42, it, plus 68 is 96 yeah so um not it, it yeah pretty pretty close to it at least okay twice as many shading units for doing pixel and vertex shader fragment and vertex shaders so uh we did shaders with you last semester i think right you did a little a little shader assignment you guys remember that shader toy right at the end of the semester I was, in the, I was in the summer one. I don't think we did that. Mm, yeah, okay. So, uh, shaders are like little programs that run on your CPU, or uh, run on your GPU, really. And so, the 3090 has, uh, what, two and a half times as many shader shader units as the 2080 Ti. So, it can run more of those programs more quickly. And so, um, if you look at just the raw performance, uh, it's almost triple the performance. Right. Yep. So, um, let's pull up a uh, gigaflops of an i9-12. Okay. Single core performance. Flops. So the GPU inside of an i9 is 0.78 teraflops, and on a uh, um, 3090, it's 70. So it's 100 times more powerful than integrated graphics. And that doesn't even explain the CPU. <laughs> it doesn't even list it. Yeah, but GPUs are much more powerful than CPUs. And so by being able to move this off the CPU, into the GPU, then you can get hardware acceleration for a lot of these things that um, used to be CPU bound. And so it, it, that allows you to do real time ray tracing. Okay. So the way that, the way that it works is for, here's your screen. Okay. Little monitor here. It's a campfire apparently, I don't know. So for every, the, the way that, that, that ray tracing works is for every pixel on your screen, what it does is it shoots an invisible ray from that into the world. You've got, you know, boxes and... Boxes and maybe that's a mirror or something, I don't know. And so it shoots it from the camera. Here's the camera. 
drawing it as an eyeball. It shoots it from the camera through that pixel into the world and wh whatever it hits, like let's say this is a red box here, then uh, if there's no reflection or anything, then it will just write back, it'll report back to the that pixel. It's like, you're red. Okay. Easy. Right? And you do that, you repeat that for every, for every pixel on the screen. And if you've got um, 4K pixels, um, Thirty eighty four by twenty one sixty three eight four zero times sixty, and we had what ninety six? Uh, no, we had eighty eighty two real time cores. So every real time core is going to be responsible for one hundred and one thousand um, pixels per frame. If you want to get hundred frames a second then you're talking about uh, 10 million. It's got to process 10 million rays per second. So every, every, every real-time core is going to process millions of rays per second. And it, so it's got to be able to very quickly pro, you know, go through the BVH, find what it hits, and if there's a reflection, you know, like if you're, let's say this is a mirror here. It's a purple mirror, I don't know. And so you shoot a ray through that pixel, it hits the mirror, then you've got to spawn another ray over this way, and there's like a ocean over there. Then this pixel is going to be colored with the color of the ocean. So there's a lot going on with ray tracing. That's why ray tracing has traditionally been considered a slower but more accurate rendering method. Um, Nowadays, like it's getting to the point where, you know, you can actually run it in real time. Now, a lot of video games, like like you were saying, they don't actually, they don't actually render the world using ray tracing. What they do is they'll they'll use it for lighting. And so, if you have a um, if you have a, a a window over here, and there's like light coming into the room, and you've got a light bulb over here, then what happens is um, you hit a you know you send a pixel comes through here and it reflects off and it hits here. Um, this pixel here can know that it is being lit both by the light bulb and by the window by something called a shadow ray. So every time you make a collision, you can find out how much light is incident directly on that point, right? The direct lighting is when a light shines directly on a surface. But then there's also something called bounce lighting, which is this, right? So if you want to know how lit this surface is, it's based on how lit surfaces are near it, right? Have you ever held up like a red t-shirt next to a, a white wall? Stover, Grinty? Yeah, it makes the wall kind of red. It makes the wall kind of red, right? Because it's the light's bouncing off of it. And so you've got something called global illumination. Um, and so what happens is that this RTX core sends these lights and they bounce around. And you know when it hits this point here, it knows this point is directly lit from these two points. And so this point, because it's reflective or whatever, is going to pick up light from this point. And so what happens is that you get light is kind of bouncing all over the place. and um, how accurate it is is based on how many rays you send out. And so um, because you're, you're so time limited, like you want to get 100 frames a second or, or better really these days, um, what they'll end up doing is they'll actually do the lighting over time. And so every frame it'll, it'll generate a certain number of rays of light and it'll kind of directly light an area and then as things pick up that bounce, they'll light. And then as things pick up that light, that they light. And so the light will actually kind of move through the world over time. And, and, and this is like frame to frame, so you might not even notice it. But because sometimes it's a random process, uh, you'll actually get noise. So uh, um, 
So NVIDIA has the, uh, here, let me show you. There you go. So this is what it would look like if you didn't have a denoiser on. You see how, how erroneous the, uh, the lighting is, right? You send a ray out and it scatters randomly and it hits a light point. So you have a little flash of light there. You send out a ray this way, it bounces this way. You send out a ray this way, it hits the light back there. Do you, do you guys see what I'm getting at? This is what kind of like the raw, unprocessed results of all that look like. Not great, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, this, it sucks, but it's, it's interesting to see, though. So, um, what you can do, though, is you can apply a filter to the image. And... Um, yeah, you can see all the noise in it, right? And you apply a filter, and it, there, you see the difference? Nah. <laughs> so with the filter off, you get all these weird bright and dark areas, and then you kind of filter them. Ah, this is so annoying. Watch when it turns on. Watch that part. See that? Pretty cool. What kind of filter is that? Uh, NRD. Uh, okay. See the difference? And and yeah. even even after you filter it, if your if your RTX quality settings is low, you'll still see like flecks of static and things like that in the uh, in the game. Um. You see that reflection there? That was kind of cool. Um, and so they're doing real-time reflections, which is really beautiful. It's much better than screen space reflections. And um, any more noise for me? Nothing. It's just a trailer. Okay. I'm glad you're promoting, uh, there we go, okay, right? And so the filter would basically look at the, uh, how much, how many light points, how many dark points you have, and then figure out how shadowed that area is from it. And actually over time, it can accumulate information about how well lit that spot is. And uh, and so you'll if you actually look really closely, you can tell when you're in an RTX uh, system that's doing RTX global illumination, because you'll actually see the shadows move or like, um, kind of like, do the staticky kind of thing. Even with the filtering on, if you pay close attention, you'll you'll still see it. Um, let's see if we can see it over here. Yeah, maybe not. Be more useful if we were in a in a game. Um, and that's because they're calculating reflections in real time, or like they're just constantly shooting rays of light, mm -hmm. so it's just like yep. an angry world. Yep, so you're, you're shooting light and it bounces off things and they can scatter in different directions, right? And so depending on where it scatters to, if that point is well lit, then you'll get a lot of light because you reflect it onto a... You know, it's like when you look at a mirror in the sun, right? If you look at the sun in a mirror, it's quite bright, you know what I mean? And so these rays are kind of scattering over there. And so, yeah, yeah, just, just like you said. So over time, the rays will kind of gather more information about what lights they can not see, but somebody they can see can see, or somebody that you can see who can see who can see. Like imagine a light like reflecting off, one, off a mirror onto another mirror onto another mirror, you know what I mean? And... Uh, and global illumination is sort of the solution. Like, um, rendering without global illumination, rendering with global illumination. You see, this is only direct lighting, right? You have a, you have a rectangular light here, and it comes down here and it bounces immediately off the glass and hits the camera. It hits the metal sphere here, hits the camera. But all this area back here is like pitch black, right? Because even though this is well lit, none of the light 
further reflects. It's only direct lighting, right? And so when you solve the global illumination problem, then that's what I was saying, like with the t-shirt, you get this uh, luminosity, this radiosity effect here. And you can see reflections down here, which I guess you had before. Um, but you can see light on the back of the white sphere here. You see that? Kind of cool, right? So, um, it creates just some really amazing, really nice looking effects. Cause you got like a skylight here, the, the light comes in from the sun down. Uh, apparently this way, the, the sun's coming down this way. It hits these things and this is really well lit. And so if all you were doing was direct lighting and there was no other light in the scene, you'd only have this area as light and everything else would be like pitch black, right? And so usually in video games, we would add what's called ambient lighting, where we just add a light to every pixel on the screen just because, you know, that's how lights work in real life. If there's a bright light over there, the light will sort of scatter and you'll get this kind of like, you know, diffuse sort of unspecified lighting that just you can see in you know if you're if you've ever been like in an office with all the blinds closed on a bright day you guys know what i'm talking about like you're, you're in a room all the lights are off the windows are closed the doors are closed and you can still see right there's yeah. like some light creeping in yeah and it's just it, you don't really know where it's coming from right it's just kind of like around you and you kind of hold up your hand and there's no like source of light it's just kind of ambient light and, and that's to sort of simulate this, like, like you were saying earlier, you know, we've been moving more and more towards simulating the real world. And, and so what we're doing now is we're saying, well, if that's a, if that wall is bright, well, that's a source of light too. And so that's going to scatter light over here, you know? And if that's like a medium light, then it's going to scatter a little bit of light on that part there and, and, and so on and so forth. Right. And so over time you can sort of solve which areas are brighter and which ones are darker and, um, and it creates this really nice very pleasing to the eye uh, look without having without having to cheat you know at it yes yeah, so this is this has to be with no no bounce lighting right you see that like that's very much like direct lit you know what I mean yeah I've been I last semester in 50a the game I was making was all indoors and yeah I had the problem where with lighting it's just, if there wasn't light, it's just pitch black. Yeah. Because it's all covered. You see how unnatural this looks, too? Mm. Like, this might be realistic if you're on the moon, right? And there's been a vacuum leak and all the air has been sucked out, you know? Because <laughs> on Earth, uh, the atmosphere will actually scatter light. You know what I mean? If you have atmosphere, the light will scatter automatically. You won't get, like, like this would not be just pitch black. You know, it just looks very unnatural. Uh, only on, only on like um, moon colony game. Uh, let's see. Yeah, something like that, right? That uh, that you just get those very harsh shadows. Like if it's not directly lit, it's just not lit. Um, only on like areas with no atmosphere whatsoever. And that's kind of why it looks unnatural to us, you know, because everywhere there's atmosphere, there's this sort of diffuse light going on. So that's our, uh, that's our lecture for today. Um, if you, if you want to play the Quake 2 RTX demo, it, uh, it, it does a pretty fantastic job doing uh, global illumination. I, I watched a talk by the developers, um, Um, yeah, the models are still very much uh, mid nineties. Um, but polygons. yeah, you count the polygons, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, particle effects are pretty bad too, but yeah, you see, you see the difference in the lighting though. The lighting is top notch. I'll play that for you again. So yeah, you see the difference? Yeah. Same. It's the same level. Yeah, go on. I was just saying, lighting makes such a big difference, even with all the low texture and 
low polygons. Yeah, this is the original level. And because there's light coming in through this hole here, um, the light is going to hit here and it's going to bounce over to these areas. These areas aren't directly lit. Like you can see there's direct lighting right here and these are emissive surfaces. They're emitting light. You can see these barrels here are catching some of the light from this. But this is a very gloomy, you know, scene. This is very dark up here with just ambient lighting probably on it. But with the, uh, with the global illumination on, they solve that equation. And you can see there's a light up here now because it's bouncing around the room, you know. And it, and it just creates, look at that. Oh, do you see that? Do you see the difference there? Like it's night and day, quite literally. It's night and day difference. Like that is a gorgeous, gorgeous effect. You know what I mean? Despite the fact the graphics are still like, <laughs> there's a triangle and there's <laughs> the the particle effects are terrible and the the models are terrible and the the textures I think might have been upscale a little bit but um, overall it's it, it's a very interesting I, I I played it for a little bit it's weird because it's this weird mix of like super low you know poly count with like really beautiful lighting and it's a little bit jarring almost I don't know. okay so yeah so this is is50b thank you for uh thank you for coming out taking second semester uh we're going to be continuing a discussion over the next couple of weeks i think i might just make this the is50b maybe come on thursdays as well i don't know i, I need to figure out this situation especially since i'm not going to get my covid test results back till saturday so who knows what's going to happen but uh, we might just have this section be IS50B if that works for you. And then um, we'll do lectures and I'll give you coding assignments that will take you beyond um, simply doing a real engine stuff. Uh, we'll be doing some C++ coding as well this semester. And if there's anything in particular you want to know about, um, please let me know. And I'll, I'll put together a lecture for you because there's only two of you. So, you know. <laughs> Just ask, you know. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so. that sounds good to me. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you again for signing up for the class, so it didn't get canceled. And um, <laughs> I think I think it should be fun. All right. Yeah. Sure. All right. Thanks, guys. I'll see you on yeah, Thursday. Cool. Well, let's say on Thursday, but it, it, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. All right. Cool. See you guys. Yeah, that'll be good. What was that? You too. Have a good one. Yeah.